What if Ash Ketchum woke up on time on the day he picked his starter? What if, instead of being limited to just Pikachu, he had the choice of any of the three Kanto starters? How would everything have played out in a world where he started with Squirtle instead? What if I'd taken less than two years to make this video? Some of these questions have answers, and in this series we have attempted to find them. So far, the butterfly effect has rippled out and had big impacts on Team Rocket, Misty, Gary, and more. We've covered five regions and almost 800 episodes thus far. Now, let's get into reimagining Kalos and add another 150 episodes to the pile. Ash arrives at Lumios Airport with only Blastoise in his team. Unlike the original timeline, there's no Team Rocket in tow. Alexa has accompanied Ash back to her home region, which is good news for all of us because it means we get to see her Helioptile. Having promised him a gym battle with her sister Viola, Alexa is disappointed to inform Ash that she's away from her gym. That leads Ash straight to the Lumio City Gym, but he's thrown out when he reveals he doesn't have four Kalos badges yet. As he's falling to Earth, he runs right into Clemens and Bonnie. Raring to go and without any gyms around that'll take him, Ash challenges Clement to a battle and the Lumios native accepts. As Pikachu battles Clement's newly caught Bunnelby in the original timeline, we're changing course again. Blastoise beats Bunnelby without any interruptions from Team Rocket, which means Froakie gets to watch the entire thing and we miss out on this amazing line. Of course, Froakie's gummy frubbles isn't a move. Yes, I will include that line in literally any video I get the opportunity to. Despite the changes, Froakie remains drawn to Ash and steps in to challenge Blastoise. The two water starters clash and with Froakie's passion driving both Ash and Blastoise on, they push a little too hard. The Bubble Frog Pokemon is knocked out by Dig and having sustained a little more damage than seems safe, Clement suggests they rush it to the professor's lab nearby. When they get there, Professor Sycamore informs them that it has abandoned multiple trainers, but ensures them that he'll take care of it. While Froakie's being treated, Ash waits by its side as Sycamore tells them about his research into Mega Evolution. We again avoid an interruption from Jesse and James, which stops the whole Rampage and Garchomp episode. That leaves Serena out in the cold for the moment, as she never spots Ash on the news. I'm sure we'll get back to her later, though. When Ash brings out Blastoise for some treatment, the professor tells him about the potential for Mega Evolution lying within it. Ash is curious, but he's still mostly focused on making sure Froakie's okay. When the water type comes to, it makes clear to Ash that it wants to join him on his journey, so Ash officially has his first Kalos Pokemon. Clemens and Bonnie lead Ash to the local Pokemon Center so he can register for the Kalos League and then offer to adventure alongside him. Ash gladly accepts, so the trio head off in the direction of Santaloon City. Sadly, without James around, we miss out on another great line delivery back in Lumios. Oh, my croissant! <laughs> the group come across a Dedenne and a Fletchling just like the original timeline, and nothing changes there. Ash adds the flying type to his team, while Clement catches the... fifth best Pikachu clone so Bonnie can take care of it. Elsewhere, Serena's beginning to question her future, having realized that Rhyhorn Racing is definitely not for her. When Ash, Clement, and Bonnie arrive in Santolin City, they meet up with Viola and Alexa, which means more Helioptile. That's a win for all of us, but before long we have to move on to the gym battle. I guess we can look at that while we wait for Helioptile to come back. In Viola's gym, it's a two-on-two -two matchup for the badge, and they get things started with Blastoise taking on Surskit. An Ice Beam from the Pond Skater Pokemon covers the field in, well, ice, but Dig prevents a rink from forming. Viola moves on to a different strategy to slow down Blastoise, but even Sticky Web isn't enough. Before too long, Bite knocks off the bug, giving Ash the early advantage. When Viola sends in Vivian as her last Pokemon, Ash decides to switch out to Fletchling. Surskit's Sticky Web sort of went everywhere, so despite being a flying type, Fletchling is still slowed massively. Without being able to rely on its speed, it's not too long before Vivian's Psychic evens up the match. When Blastoise comes back in, Viola takes advantage of the speed drop that comes with Sticky Web and gets Vivian to put the water type to sleep. That neutralizes Blastoise, allowing Vivian to charge up and fire off a solar beam that hands Viola the win. So, 0-1 oh for Ash in the Kalos gyms. Not a great start. After a few days of training aided by Alexa, Ash returns to the gym. The beginning of the battle plays out very similarly. This time around, Hydro Pump prevents Sticky Web and Fletchling does a little better against Vivian, but it still all comes down to Blastoise and the Butterfly. Knowing all about Sleep Powder and Solar Beam now, Ash is more on his guard. The battle concludes with Blastoise sending itself sky high with a Hydro Pump and connecting with an Ice Punch. That knocks off Vivian and earns Ash the Bug Badge, and with one slot full in his case, he sets his sights on Silage City next. 
That destination means Ash, Clement, and Bonnie have to head back through Lomeo City, where Ash learns about his companion's position as gym leader, as well as his current struggles. Clement finds himself locked out of his own gym, but after defeating Clembot, a robot that he built to defend the gym, it doesn't matter, everything's fixed. Unfortunately, further down the road, Team Rocket's absence results in a lack of bonding moments for Clement and Chespin. Without that, there's no connection made, so Clement never catches the grass starter. Their absence also leads to Froki learning Quick Attack instead of Double Team, which sounds odd, but you're just going to have to take my word for it. Outside of Camp Free Town, our trio never cross paths with Malamar either. Again, this one's on Team Rocket. When they reach the Battle Chateau, Ash and Co. get to enjoy a pretty fantastic battle between Alexa and the Salage City Gym Leader, Grant. This actually has no relevance to the story at all, but for a throwaway battle that lasts less than two minutes, it's really good. Once Ash makes it to Salage City and challenges Grant in the gym, he learns that he'll get to use three Pokemon against the leaders too. As a result, it's a fairly simple win for Ash. Just like the original timeline, Froakie KOs Onyx with Water Pulse before falling to a Draco Meteor from Grant's Tyrant. Fletchling then goes down to a Dragon Tail, and only then do we divert from the original path. Instead of Pikachu, Ash sends out his Blastoise third, and against a weakened Tyrant, it's an easy victory. The Cliff Badge fills the second slot in his case, and then on Grant's recommendation, Ash sets course for Shalor City. On the way there, our trio stop in with Professor Sycamore and get the chance to meet the Kalos champion Diantha. The Professor is there to research her Mega Gardevoir, so they all watch her battle Magnus. Serena is also in attendance for the exhibition match, hoping for a chance to meet one of her idols in Diantha. The champion wins comfortably without even having to Mega Evolve her ace. After the battle, Ash, Clement, Bonnie, and Sycamore head towards Diantha's dressing room where they learn that she's already left the stadium. While there though, they run into Serena who recognizes Ash immediately. She introduces herself and then noticing Ash's disappointment that he won't get to battle Diantha, she suggests that they head for a local cafe that makes a legendary chocolate cake. That somewhat cheers him up. While they prepare to split up the final piece of cake that the cafe had left, they come across a disguised Diantha who grabs a small slice with gratitude. Feeling her own spirits lifted from the delightful dessert, Diantha accepts a challenge from Ash. Blastoise takes the field against Gardevoir, and although it's not really required, Diantha decides to Mega Evolve the Embrace Pokemon just to satisfy the onlooking professor. Again, Team Rocket's absence changes our course and allows the two to finish their battle. It's another win for Diantha, but impressed by Ash and Blastoise, she talks about the possibilities of Mega Evolution for the two with Ash and Sycamore. The battle also makes its mark on Serena, who decides she wants a Pokemon for herself, so accompanies the Professor back to Lumios to get herself a starter. Alright, the last 90 seconds were spent on one episode where not much really happens for Ash's original journey, so you can see why going through 150 of these things can take a while. Realistically not two years, but still. Somewhere near Geosenge Town, Ash, Clemens, and Bonnie run into Karina, and she battles and beats Froakie with her Lucario. The water type does put on a good show, but it's overcome by the experienced aura Pokemon. Karina tells them that she's the Shalor City Gym Leader, but she's currently away searching for the Lucario Knight, the Megastone needed to Mega Evolve Lucario. Seeing as there wouldn't be a Gym Leader present in Shalor if he made it there, Ash decides that the group should join Karina on her search. Without Jesse and James getting in their way, Karina and Lucario score their 100th straight win in a training battle against Clemens and Bunnelby. That's the number they were waiting for to prove to themselves that they were ready for Mega Evolution and everything that comes with it. When the group reaches Geosenge Town, we get another Helioptile sighting. This is a great season. None of this is really that important to Ash, but Karina has to defeat a Blaziken to get the Lucario Knight, and it turns out it's Karina's grandfather's. They call me the Mega Evolution Guru. I'm Gherkin. They call him the Mega Evolution Guru. He's... Gherkin. Look, I mean, there's probably like... 50 four or five year olds out there called Pickle Rick, so he's not alone by any means, but it's gotta be tough for a kid named Gherkin. Anyway, old Gherky's granddaughter gets the Lucario Knight, and the first thing on her to-do list is a battle. Ash and Blastoise take the challenge, but Lucario's combative instincts have awakened and it no longer cares what Karina thinks. Lucario's merciless aggression becomes too much and the Gherkster has to step in with his own Lucario. After some much needed healing for Karina's partner Pokemon, Steve Gurkle challenges his granddaughter to a Mega Lucario vs Mega Lucario battle. It again goes just terribly for the Shalor Gym Leader and the Pickled Cucumber really squirts salt into the wound. He tells Karina that she doesn't understand Lucario yet and needs to train at Pomus Mountain with one of his own personal mentors. As that'll send the next Gym Leader even further off course, Ash, Clemens, and Bonnie decide to continue journeying with her. 
That turns out to be an amazing decision when they reach Pumice Mountain and they're greeted by the best Pokemon ever. Mabel is also there. Karina and Mabel have another Mega vs Mega battle, and obviously Mega Mobile wins. Lucario lost control once more, but in time, with Mabel's help, Karina and Lucario learn to control Lucario's aura when it Mega evolves. While they're there, Serena tracks down Ash and Co and asks if she can travel alongside them. Of course, the trio welcomes her with open arms. Oh, and she still got Fennekin, by the way. Nothing changes from the original timeline as far as Holucha is concerned. In a forest on the road to Shalor City, Ash encounters and catches a Holucha. There's a whole episode based around it, but all you need to know is that Ash has a Holucha now. That comes into play in the Kalos Canyon, where Ash has a sky battle against Moria. He speaks friend and enters the battle with Fletchling, but Moria's Talonflame has no interest in taking on the tiny bird. Instead, it has its sights set on Holucha. After Moria gets the win, that's it. Team Rocket aren't there, so Fletchling doesn't get the chance to earn Talonflame's respect, and that means no evolution just yet. We then get to experience a whole fever dream in the Reflection Cave, which is… odd. I don't really know what to make of this one, so let's move on. Froakie learned Cut too, but that's not that important. After a several episode detour to Professor Sycamore's week-long Pokemon Summer Camp, where they met Shauna, Tierno, and Trevor, Ash and friends finally reach Shalor City. Back in the timeline where Ash smashed his alarm clock, in his battle against Karina, he decided to ape Tierno's rhythmic battling style. That doesn't make any sense for a trainer who's so supremely confident in his own brand of battling, so we're scrapping that here. Mianfu and Holucci get the battle underway, and after a spirited back and forth, the wrestling Pokemon picks up the win with Flying Press. When Karina sends in Machoke, Ash replaces Holucci with Fletchling. The fighting type's overwhelming power is too much for the tiny robin at first, but pushed to its limits, Fletchling evolves and comes back strongly. In the end, the newly learned Flame Charge helps give Ash a 3-1 advantage. Unsurprisingly, Karina's Lucario is the last of her three and she immediately Mega Evolves it. Fletchinder does at least manage to land a Flame Charge before being virtually eviscerated Randy Johnson style by a power-up punch. Holucha re-enters the battle next, but just like Fletchinder, it only scores a single hit before Aurasphere evens things up. The final face-off sees a rematch between Mega Lucario and Blastoise, but with a slightly more controlled atmosphere. The two are incredibly evenly matched, but having already taken two big hits, Mega Lucario is up against it. Eventually, Blastoise connects from below with Dig to finish off Mega Lucario and earn Ash a third Kalos Gym win. Karina hands over the Rumble Badge and thanks Ash for his company before Gherkin recommends he visit Coomarine City next. The gang meets up with Shauna in nearby Lagoon Town and they join her in attending a performance by Arya, the Kalos Queen. Not literally like a monarch, but basically the champion of performers. Arya's performance is just a short intro to the Lagoon Town Pokemon Showcase, which is quickly thrown off the rails when a wild Pancham interrupts the first performer. In the original timeline, Clement's Chespin ends up chasing the Panda Cub into the forest, but without the Grass Starter around, that doesn't happen. As a result, Serena never catches Pancham, which means no decision on her future just yet. Another absence that makes a difference is that without Team Rocket, Clement's reunion with Luxio plays out a little differently. It's all still very adorable though, and the Electric type does end up joining him anyway, so that's good. We're now onto the Kalos Quest portion of the Gen 6 anime, and this theme goes unnecessarily hard. In a battle against the ninja and his Barbarical, Froakie ends up evolving through sheer force of determination to protect Sanpei's Greninja. In the process, it learns Aerial Ace. Serena's mom then shows up to try to convince her daughter to be a Rhyhorn racer. Serena may be unsure of what she wants to do with her life, but she does know that she's not interested in that. There's nothing really changed in this moment, but I learned that apparently Skiddo is pronounced Skidoo, and I'm just not sure how I feel about that. Actually, I am. I don't like it. It clearly has to come from Kiddo, so why the hell would it be Skidoo? On the road to Kumarine City, Agumi crash lands on Ash's head, but somehow doesn't cause serious damage. With or without Team Rocket's intervention, Ash seems destined to catch Gumi, so let's add it to the team. Shortly after that encounter, Ash is tracked down by Misty, who explains that she's been waiting for a rematch ever since their last battle at the Evergrande Conference. Professor Oak informed her where Ash was, and she made a beeline for him in Kalos. They settle on having a 1v1 battle between Ash's Frogadier and Misty's freshly caught Scrawl. The speed advantage lies with Frogadier, who connects with multiple quick attacks, but the combination of smokescreen and acid turn the tide. Skrelp fills the battlefield with a thick cloud of smoke and hammers the frog with repeated feint attacks until it can no longer stand. Ash has no response for the strategy and without Frogadier knowing double team in our timeline, he can't even stall out the smoke. 
So Skrelp has gathered a small measure of revenge for Misty, who parts realising she has a lot of catching up to do with regards to Kalos gym badges. While Clemence is getting over some pretty dicey takeout food, everyone meets Ramos, who is delightfully 1920s. That's an oxymoron, for sure. What are you whippersnappers doing? This place is strictly off limits to the general public. Nothing cuts deeper than whippersnapper. Just tears you apart. We really need to bring that back around. Ramos not only brings us some amazing dialogue, but also our first completely unchanged gym battle. When Ash and Ramos go head to head, we see Fletchinder, Holuch, and Frogadier, which doesn't need to change. The roller coaster battle comes down to Ash's Frogadier and Ramos's Go Goat. Instead of relying on double team, the Bubble Frog Pokemon uses Quick Attack for simultaneous dodging and attacking. With some help from Froggy's Gummy Frubbles, which isn't a move in case you need reminding, Aerial Ace connects before a Water Pulse finishes off Go Goat to earn Ash another victory. The plant badge makes four, and as that's the number required for a Lumio City gym battle, that's where we're heading next. As Serena's yet to decide on her future, we can skip the Coomerine City Pokemon Showcase, which only has a small impact on our timeline. We basically just don't get any haircutting from Serena. That's probably for the best, as an impromptu emotional haircut turning out well is far more unrealistic than being unharmed by a weight dropping off a skyscraper onto your face. Next up, we've got another couple of changes without Team Rocket, as Gumi doesn't evolve in the Lumios Badlands. They also aren't there to divert our group towards the power plant, so Luxio doesn't evolve either. So, after a whole lot of nothing in the Badlands, Clement takes a helicopter back to Lumio City to train for his upcoming battle with Ash. We don't have to wait too long for the Gumi evolution though, as in a double battle against Tierno's Raichu and Wartortle, Sligo debuts along with its new move, Dragon Breath. Back in Lumios, there's a big controversy where Clembot is a judge to have been committing crimes around the city. I feel like if a robot you created was doing that, then you'd be on the hook for it, but not so much here. Clembot, look at this. You're under arrest. In the end, it isn't even Clement's Clembot, but Dark Clembot, I don't know why I'm telling you this. It's just as ridiculous and irrelevant to Ash's story as it sounds, so let's move on to the gym battle. Clements and Ash get things going just like their original face-off, with Blastoise and Bunnelby recreating the opening of their first battle. Clements has been training hard though, and with Wild Charge and Dig, Bunnelby is now a much greater match for Blastoise. The result is still the same though, with the water type coming out on top. Clement calls on his Heliolisk next, so Ash switches to Sligu. The dragon type is completely outmatched by Heliolisk's Thunder Wave, Flash, and Dragon Tail, so before it's too late, Ash switches to Holucha. Even though Heliolisk can recover with Parabolic Charge, a high jump kick earns Holucha the win. Luxio enters the battle last for Clement, and after setting up Electric Terrain, the Spark Pokemon makes quick work of Holucha. The odds are still against the Gym Leader, but when Luxio evolves in the battle against Blastoise and wins with Wild Charge, it levels things up. That leaves only Luxray and Sligu. Ash starts out by calling for Rain Dance, which thanks to Hydration cures the Goop Pile's paralysis. It also sets up the conditions for its evolution, which occurs just when things look bleak. The newly evolved Gudra breaks out Dragon Pulse for the first time, and with Luxray stretched to its absolute limit, that hit is enough for the win. Clement thanks Ash for an intense battle, and hands over the Voltage Badge. Serena and Bonnie congratulate the two on their great performances, and then the group heads over to Professor Sycamore's lab for a demonstration. Without any interruption from Team Rocket, Sycamore is able to Mega Evolve his Garchomp and give everyone another example of what Mega Evolution can be. Then it's time to leave for Laver City. In the wetlands outside Lumios, Ash ends up saying goodbye to his Gudra, even without Team Rocket around. I think regardless of the situation, Gudra's main motivation is protecting the Pokemon there, so it makes sense for it to stay. We get several very adorable Pokemon scenes before Ash and Gudra say a tearful goodbye. That's obviously followed up by everyone spending a day with a ghost. Well, you see, I'm not quite alive. I think, well, you see, I'm not quite alive is going to be Gen Alpha's version of I'm dead. So can everyone who's enjoying the video just drop a why Synqua in the comments? Thank you. When Ash and friends reach Laver City, they run into Sawyer, a trainer Clement defeated in a recent gym battle. The group gets to watch Sawyer taking on the Laver City gym leader, Valerie, but once more, he's easily defeated. When Ash gets his turn, the battle is actually unchanged from the original timeline. Fletchinder and Sylveon get the battle started, and a Steel Wing prompts a very adorable reaction from the fairy type evolution. Oh, are you all right? Yeah. They go back and forth, but ultimately another Steel Wing gets the win for Fletchinder. Spritzy's next and sets up Trick Room, which Ash doesn't seem to understand as he calls for Flame Charge over and over. Fletchinder's speed is going up and up with every use, which just makes Spritzy quicker and quicker inside the Trick Room. 
By the time it fades though, Fletchender is way too fast for Spritzy and easily connects with Steelway. A Moonblast still manages to finish off the Ember Pokemon who took far too much damage while inside the Trick Room. When Ash sends out Holucha, Valerie calls for Trick Room once more. It puts Ash at a disadvantage again, but Holucha manages to break the walls down by slamming Spritzy into the side with X Scissor. They say it's because X Scissor is super effective on Trick Room, you know, Bug vs Psychic, which I guess makes sense? Does it? I don't know. Let's say yes. Regardless of whether or not it makes sense, High Jump Kick gets the win for Ash and Holucha, so let's add the very creatively named Fairy Badge to the case. I know I've mentioned it before, but Kalos really just knocked it out of the park on badge names. It's a pity we won't see Valerie much more. Sylvie, Sil, Sil, yeah. Sil, Sil. We need more of Valerie. Before Sawyer leaves the group, he battles Ash and gets <laughs> absolutely crushed. On the upside, his Trico evolves before being defeated by Frogadier, so that's something. While Holooch is doing some solo training as the gang stops to rest, it stumbles across a Pokemon egg that it brings back to Ash. That egg hatches a Noibat, which Ash ends up adding to his team, replacing one dragon with another and taking his team back to five. Unlike the original timeline, we don't get any more major changes before Ash reaches Anastar City. A battle with Team Rocket causes Moltres to be awoken and it ends up going head to head with Fletchinder, who evolves in the heat of battle. We never get the legendary encounter here and thus no evolution. Originally, Serena was inspired to capture a dancing Eevee she sees because it seems like it would be perfect in Pokemon showcases. We don't have the showcase element here, but I refuse to believe anyone would not want to catch this Eevee. During the night, Serena gets up from her shelter tent, which is amazing, and finds Eevee wearing the flower crown she made for it. She decides to dance with Fennekin in the hopes that it'll prove to Eevee that it would fit in perfectly on her team. It does end up showing up and decides to join Serena on her journey, so I guess it worked, and finally she has a second Pokemon. In Anastar City, the group learn of an upcoming Pokemon showcase from Shauna, who suggests that Serena and her Pokemon may enjoy it. To help Shauna prepare and test Serena's chemistry with Eevee, the two girls team up against Ash and Tierno's Blastoise duo. The rhythmic battling between Serena's Eevee and Tierno's Blastoise almost becomes a dance which really helps Eevee come out of its shell. Shell? Like Blastoise? Get it? Can I get a Wysinqua? Seeing Shauna win the eventual Pokemon Showcase inspires Serena and convinces her that she too wants to be a Pokemon performer. A bit of a late start versus the original timeline, but we got there. Alright, back to Ash. When the time comes for his gym battle against Olympia, we finally got another change up to the original timeline. Using Fletchinder instead of Talonflame does see some slight differences in Ash's 7th Kalos gym challenge. The Anastar City gym requires challenges to defeat Olympia in a double battle. Ash selects Frogadier and Fletchinder to take on Olympia's Meowstic and Meowstic. The early battle sees Ash's duo struggling to connect at all with the pair of psychic cats. The male Meowstic deals with defensive work and makes use of Prankster to assist his partner. The female Meowstic focuses on the other side of the coin using Keen Eye to fire off attacks without any let up. Our timeline lacks double team on Frogadier and features an unevolved Fletchinder without Brave Bird so there's a big switch up in strategy. Ash's Pikachu also takes part in the battle from the sideline helping count out the timing for Future Sight. This time around his game plan centers around the speed advantage using Flame Charge and Quick Attack to dominate that aspect of the battle. In the anime, Kenai sort of turns Dark Pulse into a homing missile which hunts its target until it connects. Using the speed of Frogadier and Fletchinder, Ash manages to get the Dark Pulse to redirect into Meowstic for huge damage. That puts Ash's duo in complete control, and from there they push on to victory. Fletchinder evolves at the end of the battle, having put everything into the win. The Psychic Badge, creative, makes for 7, meaning one more gym victory will qualify Ash for the Lumios Conference. Deciding that the Snowbell City Gym will be the perfect place to earn that final badge, Ash sets off in that direction. On the way there, Bonnie finds a Zygarde Core which she nicknames Squishy. The Pokedex has no idea which Pokemon it is, but after it escapes, they learn that Team Flare are trying to capture it. Ash, Clement, and Serena battle against the generically evil group and end up making off with whatever it's called. It's... um... Squishy! Ah, that's the one. Squishy. We even briefly get to see Squishy cosplaying as Rottweiler from Yu-Gi-Oh! GX, which is fun to see. In a battle against a Quilladin who's trying to prove its worth to Serena's Eevee, Fennekin evolves into Brakeson before defeating the Grass-type. Liking the style she sees from Quilladin, Serena decides to catch it, taking her team to three. Shortly after that, the group come across a Litleo who's been abandoned by its pride. 
Ash finds the lion cub a little too adorable to leave alone, so just like Serena days earlier, decides to add another Pokemon to his team. Then it's time for another fever dream. People are Pokemon, Pokemon are people, in fact only Meowth and Pikachu seem sane. Also, Squishy is like an English professor or something? I'm not, not really sure what's going on. My, my, does that astonish you? This is a very weird episode. They're also being chased by Calcifer from Hal's Moving Castle, which makes about as much sense as anything else. We then get a short arc in Ninja Village. Sanpei has popped up a couple of times so far, both when Froakie learned Quick Attack and again when it evolved into Frogadier. It's him that invites Ash, Clement, Serena, and Bonnie into Ninja Village, where his family has lived for generations. While they're there, the village is attacked, and as he's present for all of the frogs' big moments, Sanpei gets to see another evolution. In protecting Litleo from a hit, Ash's Frogadier evolves into Greninja and learns Water Shuriken. We get our first look at Ash Greninja, although everyone there, including Ash, appears oblivious. In the end, Ash and friends help defend the village, whose people manage to rescue their chief Hanzo from the attackers. Then, everyone moves on to Kuroe Town. That's where Serena enters her first Pokemon showcase. In the original timeline, Jessie actually wins this one, but without her around, Serena's path to victory is clear. In her showcase debut, Serena wins the whole thing and earns her first princess key. Then there's two whole episodes focusing around a big squishy storyline, but it ends the same way it began, so we can ignore all of it. Before reaching Snowbell City, the group come across a wild Floette who makes fast friends with Ash's Noibat. Serena decides it would make the perfect addition to her team, so she's now got Brakeson, Eevee, Quilladin, and Floette. The team doesn't stay like that for long though. At a dance party for Pokemon performers, the gang meets Miet, who instantly clashes with Serena. The Kalos Queen Arya is also in attendance, and without Team Rocket around, James obviously can't be part of the tag battle, so we'll replace him with whoever had that Furret. So the clash sees Eevee and Litleo taking on Slurpuff and Furret. In the heat of battle, after a quick pep talk from Serena, Eevee evolves into Sylveon, adding a little more power to her showcase arsenal. Then, in a small town near Fleur City, Ash's Litleo also gets an evolution, while battling against Sawyer's Honich. Even though Pyroar has a type advantage against Sawyer's Sceptile, Ash switches out to Greninja as the two Pokemon feel destined to collide. Just when it seems like Sawyer's finally going to get one over on Ash, Greninja takes the form of Ash Greninja and pushes through to get the win. That's witnessed by Alan, who's clearly intrigued by the unusual form and waits around till the next day so he can battle the young trainer. In their face-off, Greninja seems levels below Alan's Mega Charizard X, but once it finally unleashes its new form, the ninja Pokemon gets a foothold. The early deficit was simply too much to overcome though, so Alan's ultimately victorious. The two trainers discuss the similarities and differences between Ash Greninja's form change and that of Mega Evolution. Before he leaves, Alan does make note of the fact that Ash's Blastoise, who watched the battle from the sidelines, is certainly capable of Mega Evolving. More on that later though. Probably. In Fleur City, Serena competes in her second Pokemon showcase, and just like the original timeline, she wins it all to earn a princess key. With the Pokemon Showcase Masterclass taking place soon, Serena doesn't have much time left to earn a third key to qualify. The Masterclass, which is the performer's equivalent of the Lumios Conference, will be taking place in Gluar City. Even though that'll take the group away from Snowbell, everyone agrees that Serena needs to have a chance to earn her place there. Team Rocket's absence means there's no Zapdos encounter on the way, and thus no Noibat evolution. You know, for all their negative qualities, you've got to give Jesse and James credit for the number of legendary Pokemon they allow Ash to meet. I've sort of just got to make this part up, but Jesse can help us here. We know she earned two princess keys in showcases between Kuroe Town and the Masterclass in Gluar City, so clearly there are plenty happening around this time. So, let's say Serena earns her third princess key in Jakor Town, because we don't know for sure they don't have a showcase. After that, the group reaches Gloire City, where they learn that Sean and Miet have both qualified for the Pokemon Showcase Masterclass. Nini, a performer who I don't think I've mentioned at all, makes it through the first round thanks to Jessie's absence. Serena also moves on at Miet's expense, and the third branch of the first round is won by Shauna. More importantly, I think there's a reference to me through a random person in the crowd. This episode preceded the creation of this channel, so it's a bit of a predictive reference, but I still appreciate it. I haven't even covered the format of the Masterclass yet. Basically, once three people advance through the first round, they face off in a semi-final where the winner will go one-on-one -on -one against Arya. If the Kalos Queen wins, she'll retain her title. If not, a new queen will be crowned. In the semi-final, Serena chooses to use Sylveon and Quilladin, and a slip-up from the grass type costs her dearly. 
that allows Shauna to advance through the semis and earn a shot against Arya in the final. Despite her best efforts, Shauna comes up short against Arya and the Cow's Queen retains her title. That's enough focus on Serena in this Ash-centric video, so let's get back to our primary protagonist. In a friendly battle between Ash and Clement to test out Greninja's new form, they seem to be struggling to access it. Alan shows up again and offers to take Clement's place, suggesting a more intense battle might be the key. While Greninja and Charizard are being healed up, Alan challenges Ash to a battle using their other Pokémon. Noibat and Matang go head-to-head -head, and even with a mid-match evolution, the dragon can't get the better of the steel type. Once that's over, it's time for the main event. As it comes to a close, both Pokémon have changed forms and for the first time it actually seems like Greninja's in control. The physical toll of maintaining the Ash Greninja form is more than Ash can handle though and he passes out, ending the battle early. There's a completely irrelevant episode after that because none of it transpires without Team Rocket, but there's a very adorable shiny Phantom and another Helioptile, so it's worth mentioning. Around this time, Olympia warns Diantha about an impending Kalos disaster she's foreseen and how it involves Ash and his Greninja. The champion tracks him and his friends down and they tell her about the recent developments surrounding Greninja. Diantha wants to see it with her own two eyes, so she challenges Ash to a battle. Against all odds, Ash Greninja is actually getting the better of Gardevoir, which forces the champion's hand and convinces her to Mega Evolve her ace. Even still, Ash appears to be on the cusp of winning before he passes out once again, cutting another matchup short. In fairness to him, Ash is pretty relaxed about the whole thing. Guess I passed out again. Gremlin. Excited for another chance to faint, Ash gets into a battle with Sawyer shortly after his second bout of unconsciousness. As is tradition, the battle comes down to Greninja and Sceptile. Unfortunately for him, Ash is so focused on bringing out Greninja's alternate form that he loses sight of the battle in front of him. Sawyer gets the upper hand and beats Ash for the first time without Ash Greninja ever appearing. There's actually no change in that one, but it's pretty important to the story as a whole, so it's worth including. Then it's finally... Finally time for Ash's Snowbell City Gym Battle. There are almost 30 episodes between Ash's face-off with Olympia and his meeting with Wolfric, so this one's been a long time coming. In the original timeline, Ash loses the battle against Wolfric because his physical attackers can't leave a scratch on Avalog. Instead of Holucha, Ash leads off with Pyroar in our timeline, and one flamethrower turns Wolfric's Abomasnow into a grassy puddle on the gym floor. Avalog doesn't last long against Pyroar special attacks either, and when Bergmite comes out last, Wolfric's words are proven true. I could be your most challenging opponent yet, or a total pushover. Pyroar wipes out Bergmite to complete the sweep and earn Ash the Iceberg Badge. Ash's loss with Ash Greninja in the original timeline causes a crisis of confidence which leads him to head off alone into the Winding Woods, followed by Greninja. This sort of leads to a pivotal moment as it gives us the first instance of Ash Greninja being perfected. That'll come shortly for us, though. As there's no rematch for Ash and Wolfric in this timeline, we don't ever get to see Mega Abomasnow in action. That's a response to Wolfric witnessing Ash Greninja in full flow, which didn't happen in Battle 1. Now that he's filled his badge case, though, it's time for Ash to return to Kalos' central city for the Lumios Conference. On the way there, Ash and Greninja continue working on their linked form. As they stop in the wetlands to reunite with Gudra, they head out in search of a mischievous Carbink. While they're looking around, they're forced into action to protect Carbink, and they execute Ash Greninja flawlessly for the first time. We're talking pull-off execute, not murder execute. And we're talking the word execute, and not the Pokémon execute. I feel like that made everything more confusing, if anything. Once everything is sorted out with Carbink, everyone says another goodbye to Gudra before leaving the wetlands for Lumios. On their return to the city, Sycamore calls Ash to his lab and gifts him a keystone and... Blastoisinite. It really does feel like 10 minutes before Gen 6 shipped, somebody realized they'd forgotten to name all of the gym badges and megastones, and they just did what they could. The professor was informed by Olympia of the part Ash is yet to play in Kalos' future, so it's both a reward for his great work in the region and a touch of self preservation. As they weren't held up in Snowbell City, our quartet reached Lumios early, meaning Ash gets some much needed practice in with Mega Blastoise. By the time trainers start filing into the city to compete, the two have strengthened their bond to new heights. As the first round participants congregate to see who they'll be drawn against, Ash sees Sawyer, Alan, Tierno, Trevor, and Misty have all qualified to compete. The first round draws Trevor against Alan, which isn't great news for Trevor. Everyone else draws unnamed randoms, so I feel better about their chances. 
The Lumios Conference has 3-on-3 three -three matches until the semi-final where it switches to full 6-on-6s. Six -sixes. Unsurprisingly, Elan's Mega Charizard X beats Trevor's Mega Charizard Y on his way to a sweep. Thanks to Ash's early arrival in Lumios, he never bumped into Everett in the first place so there's no delay as he heads down for his opening battle. As a result, he makes it to his battle with Titus on time without ever having to worry about a DQ. We only get to see glimpses of the face-off with Titus as Ash Greninja wipes out Altaria before it cuts away. It's safe to assume that Ash scores an easy win, but there's no real way of knowing. It's kind of frustrating, but they skip right from the opening face-off of Ash's first round match right to the end of his quarter-final against Astrid. Basically, they skip like three and a half rounds worth of matches, so there's not a lot I can do but jump ahead. We get to see a tiny bit of the round of 64, and the next thing we know, Ash and Alan have made it into the semi-finals. Misty is next to earn her spot in the final four, knocking off Remo in the quarters. That leaves Sawyer and Tierno fighting it out for the final spot. Their match has no reason to change from the original timeline, so it goes ahead as before. It comes down to Tierno's Raichu and Sawyer's Sceptile, who we see Mega Evolve for the first time. In the end, Mega Sceptile's Dragon Claw knocks out Raichu, sending Sawyer into the semis where he will face Ash. As our protagonist has Pyroar in this timeline, there's no need to recall Gudra for the semi-final, which means we miss out on this amazing shot. Ash and Sawyer aren't up first though, that honor goes to Alan and Misty. To this point in the tournament, Alan has only used Charizard and Metagross. The combined efforts of Luminion, Starmie, and Mega Gyarados finally get the best of Alan's ace though before Misty's Mega and her Gastrodon take down Metagross. That leaves Alan only 4-3 up, with his main two Pokemon gone, so the battle is on. After going up against Metagross, there isn't too much left in the tank for Gastrodon, so Unpheasant picks it off. Misty's Empoleon overpowers the Flyer though, and when it faints at the same time as Tyranitar, that leaves Alan with only two. Misty is left with just Dragalge though. The Mock Kelp Pokemon's poison eats away at Alan's Weavile until it has no more will to battle, leaving a one-on-one. -on -one. Luckily for Alan, his final Pokemon is the Part Steel Bisharp, so the poison isn't an issue anymore. Bisharp has a decent speed advantage to begin with, which is only exacerbated by paralysis from Thunder Wave. While Dragalge is frozen in place, Bisharp connects with a guillotine to end Misty's run at the semi-final stage. It will be Alan contesting the final with either Sawyer or Ash. The second semi-final begins in a very similar fashion to the original timeline version. Sawyer slacking bides its time against Hawlucha, and despite having the type disadvantage, picks up the win. Talonflame knocks out slacking to level things up, so Sawyer calls on Clawitzer. Once the water type meets Talonflame, we can finally veer off course. Instead of Pikachu, Ash brings out Blastoise next and decides to Mega Evolve his starter. The major attack and defense boosts that come with the Mega Evolution make Blastoise far too powerful for Clawitzer. When Dig finally connects, it almost deveins the shrimp, taking us back to all square. Aegislash comes in third for Sawyer, who knows he can make use of King Shield to lower Blastoise's attack. Every time Ash calls for Dig, Sawyer is prepared and takes advantage of Aegislash's stance change. There's only so long that Sawyer can play defense though, and when he attempts to attack, Aegislash gets bitten by Mega Blastoise. Tactically confusing to go around biting Ghost Swords, but effective nonetheless, it leaves Aegislash weak. When Hydro Pump lands, it's a knockout blow that takes the battle into halftime. The battlefield resets because Sawyer's down three Pokemon, but as Blastoise's attack has been lowered, Ash decides to switch out. Noivern comes in on Ash's side, with Sawyer's Salamence making it an old dragon affair. That temporarily puts us back on track with the original timeline. Noivern and Salamence are incredibly evenly matched, and neither seems able to get ahead. When Dragon Rush and Acrobatics collide in midair, both are dealt so much damage that they can't continue. Sawyer's penultimate Pokemon is Slurpuff, while Pyroar is sent in on Ash's side. That's pretty devastating news for Sawyer, because Slurpuff basically can't touch the Fire Lion. Pyroar resists all of Slurpuff's attacks, and it's the only Pokemon on Ash's team that Sawyer has had no chance to study. Before too long, Pyroar fires off a Hyper Voice that leaves Sawyer with one. Of course, that one is Sceptile, which means another big disadvantage on Sawyer's end. Way up against it, Sawyer instantly Mega Evolves Sceptile to at least have some resistance to fire. Ash starts by calling for Noble Roar, which weakens Mega Sceptile right away. After that, it seems like Ash is allowing Pyroar to absorb hits without really attempting to dodge. With the fire type seemingly reaching its limit, Ash reveals his secret weapon and calls for Endeavor. It drains Sceptile of almost all of its energy, but a Dragon Claw still takes Ash down to two. In the end, an Ash Greninja Aerial Ace sends Ash onto the final. Only Elan remains standing in his way. 
In the days between the semi-final and the final, Sycamore tells Ash about the bond phenomenon that allows him to merge with Greninja. That word makes it onto Lysander, who decides it's in his best interest to meet with Ash. That'll be more important later on though. When the final rolls around, the battle gets going with Alan's Tyranitar and Ash's Blastoise. For the first time, Alan gets to see Ash making use of Mega Evolution. Tyranitar's Sandstream conjures up a sandstorm, but Blastoise is able to wait it out underground. Once Blastoise has bided its time, it emerges from below ground to topple Tyranitar with Dig. Then, with the armor Pokemon off its feet, scores a hit from right up close with Hydro Pump. The back-to-back -back super effective attacks obliterate Tyranitar to give Ash an early lead. He recalls Blastoise and sends out Noivern, which turns out to be a mistake when Alan counters with Weavile. It's a terrible matchup for Ash, who's got to deal with Noivern's quad ice weakness. Weavile's incredible pace allows it to hit an Ice Beam, which causes a crash landing for Noivern, who's then easily dispatched by a Night Slash. Hawluchi is keen to avenge his fallen friend, and although it takes some effort to connect, once Flying Press makes contact with Weavile, it's all over. Alan sends in Bisharp next, but thanks to Ash's time watching the semi-final against Misty, he knows what to expect. Hawluchi works hard on dodging each and every Thunder Wave and Guillotine while looking for openings to attack. Even though Bisharp manages to strike with Iron Head, Hawluchi finds its spot and lands a brain-rattling high jump kick. Three of Alan's Pokemon are down now, which means it's time for a battlefield switch. The second half of the final gets underway with Talonflame and Unpheasant gliding above the newly set grass field. The two flyers go Talon to Talon for several minutes before Brave Bird and Sky Attack land simultaneously, knocking out both Pokemon. That leaves Alan down 4-2, but in a reversal of his semi-final bout, he's got his two main Pokemon in the back. Metagross is Alan's fifth Pokemon, and it'll be up against Ash's tired whole Lucha to start. The weakened Luchador has next to no energy left, and only manages a single X Scissor before falling to Psyshock. Pyroar is next in line against Metagross, and unlike Holucha, it's completely fresh. Alan knows exactly what Pyroar is capable of after his performance against Sawyer, so stays on guard. Metagross knows Rock Slide, which is a big danger to Pyroar, but the Fire-type's impressive speed keeps him alive. It takes a couple of connections, but Flamethrower eventually gets the best of Metagross. With that, Alan is down to 1 with only Charizard remaining. Alan Mega evolves his ace immediately to completely nullify Flamethrower, and then make sure to take Pyroar out quickly with Dragon Claw. Not wanting to risk Endeavor coming into play, Alan made sure Ash never got a chance. Greninja is second to last for Ash, and this face-off plays out almost identically to the original timeline. We get some amazing back and forth action between Mega Charizard X and Ash Greninja, which has been built up to through their previous battles. For every move, there's a counter. Both Pokemon take big hits and get back up. When Charizard's Blast Burn and Ash Greninja's Water Shura can meet, it's more than the water type can take. Greninja collapses to the ground, and equally drained, Ash drops to his knees. Not content with things ending like that, Blastoise helps his trainer up and then marches onto the battlefield for the final face-off of the Lumios Conference. Hydro Pump and Flamethrower get things started, and when they meet, the arena is filled with a blast of steam. While everything on the battlefield is obscured, Ash calls for Dig, and Alan tells Charizard to take to the sky. When the fog clears, Charizard flies down toward the opening where Blastoise dug down and sets up for another flamethrower. Just before it fires, Ash calls for Dig, and although it misses the mark, both trainers call for punches. Ice Punch and Thunder Punch both deal glancing blows, without really causing too much damage. On Alan's instruction, Charizard tries to lift Blastoise into the sky, but the combination of fatigue and a powerful bite makes it impossible. As Blastoise fires a Hydro Pump to cushion its fall, Alan calls for Steel Wing, which catches the water type from behind and slams it down into the mud. Seeing an opportunity to strike, Alan shouts for Dragon Claw, but as it gets close, Ash tells Blastoise to dig. The downward force sprays mud up into Charizard's face, and with its vision briefly obscured, Mega Blastoise lands a clean blow. The dig dazes Charizard, and before it can get its bearings, a Blastoise Hydro Pump ends it all. Silence hangs over the stadium for a few seconds before the crowd erupts. Alan seems shocked to have lost, but he's the first to congratulate Ash on his win. The two share a friendly handshake, and Alan thanks him for the best battle of his life. Diantha presents Ash with the trophy and praises him for an unbelievable performance. Unfortunately, before Ash has any real time to celebrate his win, Lysander accomplishes his goal of getting a tentacle monster to attack Lumio City. We then get a pretty classic villain speech from Lysander on the news. Humanity is lost, too many people, Thanos had it right, all that jazz. Also, Alan's an accessory to Ash's kidnapping, which isn't great. There's just several episodes of Zygarde stuff at this point, which isn't that important to this series. Ultimately, it comes to a head with a giant rock containing a Chespin heart barreling towards Anastar City. 
All you really need to know is that it will be very bad if it gets there. Everyone who's anyone in Kalos gathers to stop the threat and we get an amazing set piece as they work together to rescue Chespin and stop the rock. Lysander then comes back from the dead to destroy the world. It's just generally bad vibes all around. There's no way anyone can stop Lysander at this point, but seeing the humans work together convinces Z1 and Z2, aka Squishy and Red Squishy, to save them. It's true that humans are weak and powerless, but they have dreams. Honestly, a bit of a burn on all of us there. Zygarde, finally at full power, defeats Lysander and his rocky tentacle monster. It then heals Kalos before Squishy and Z2 leave Earth together. After some time has passed, everything in Kalos has sort of returned to normal. Clemens is back in the gym, and Ash has made plans to return to Kanto. Alan decides to go back to assisting Professor Sycamore in his lab, and it seems like Serena is the only one unsure of what to do next. After battling Ash for some inspiration, she makes a decision on her future. She calls up Palermo, who offered to help her after the Gloire Showcase Masterclass, and tells her that she wants to travel and perform. Palermo recommends that Hoenn would be the perfect place to go where she could compete in contests, and Serena agrees. Before we can tie a neat bow on Ash's Kalos adventure, Zorosic shows up and announces he's creating Team Neo Flare. I don't think I've mentioned Zorosic at all, but he's basically been Lysander's right hand man. His plan is to collect all of the Zygarde cells scattered around Kalos to obtain Zygarde's complete form and make Lysander's dream come true. It ultimately comes to nothing and Zorosic is arrested, but in the whole ordeal we learn that Greninja can sense the negative energy that is present wherever the remnants of Team Flare's vines lie. Squishy and Z2 return to ask for Greninja's help with preventing any sort of comeback. Both Ash and Greninja know that what happened before can never happen again, so Greninja has to remain in Kalos. Ash and Greninja have an adorable goodbye, as do Bonnie and Squishy. So that's it for Ash Greninja for now. Back at the Professor's lab, Alana reveals that the Keystone and Megastone he used were given to him by Lysander and that he turned them over to the authorities. Ash ends up returning his own Keystone and Megastone to Sycamore to further aid his research, realizing that the primary reason for the Professor handing them over in the first place was because he had to save Kalos. Everyone then says their goodbyes as Ash and Serena prepare to leave the region. Just before Serena leaves for her plane, she gives Ash a kiss goodbye while she stood on an escalator going the opposite direction, which just seems unnecessarily dangerous. Ash and Clement have a farewell battle between Blastoise and Bumblebee as a throwback to their very first meeting. We never see how this one plays out, but we do get to watch Ash return home. And that'll do it. As you can probably tell from how long this took, this was a lot of work. I just wanted to let everyone know that I won't be starting work on the next part until I can know it'll be somewhat worthwhile. So, I'm doing something that I've never done before, and setting a light goal. Uh, we'll say 25,000. If it ever reaches that total, I will get working on Alola. Naturally, the viewership has gone down with every new video as they take more and more work, and making this one has sort of put my channel on standstill, so hopefully those who want to see more have stuck around. As always, thank you so much for watching, I really do appreciate it, and I will see you next time. Bye bye!